Eight months ago, we released the first version of our white paper. The white paper goes into how we're going to decentralize, tokenize, and incentivize a subquery community within the subquery network. The subquery network is designed to be an open platform where anyone can participate and retrieve data from anyone else in the world for their applications or their blockchains. In the past eight months though, we have learned a lot. We've served hundreds of millions of requests through our managed service. We've talked to hundreds of partners across the Polkadot ecosystem. And now, based on all those learnings, we've been inspired to do better, to push harder, and to come up with some better token economic models. So that's why we're releasing a new version of the Subquery Network's white paper. This is an in-depth document that talks about exactly how the Subquery Network will work. You can read it yourself on our website. Today I thought I'd explain some of the small differences that we've added since the last version and also explain the rationale behind the decisions that we've made around the subquery network. So let's recap then. In the subquery network there are three main participants. We'll start with the most common of all, consumers. Consumers retrieve data from the subquery network. They could be using this data for their own application, uh, an NFT marketplace or a wallet for example. They exchange subquery tokens for this data or SQT as we call it in the subquery network. Consumers mostly work with indexes. Now indexes are the engine behind the subquery network. They're highly technical users that know exactly how it works and they go off, find a new project to index and work behind the scenes to do all the hard work to index the data from the blockchain for that subquery project and prepare it into a state where it can be uh, passed on to the consumers within the network. Those subquery tokens that consumers award indexes with are divvied out to the indexes that participate uh, based on the work that they do and the amount of subquery tokens that they themselves have staked. Now the amount that indexes have staked is quite important and that brings me to the third and final major participant. Delegators support their favourite indexes by delegating uh, their own spare subquery tokens to support those indexes. Because the more subquery tokens an indexer has staked, the more rewards that they can receive. Delegators obviously earn a cut of this reward, and that's why delegators will support their indexes, because they can earn yield of the subquery network and put their spare subquery tokens to work. Now, a common question I get from people is, who builds the subquery projects? Now, we call these builders architects in our network, and they're not particularly or specifically a, a user. They could be anyone. They could be delegators, uh, but more than likely, they're either they're a consumer or an indexer. An example might be that a wallet developer builds a subquery project to support their wallet. They are a consumer of that data, but they want other people to help index that, and so they might be the consumer. Or, a person might be an expert at building subquery projects and know exactly what the network needs in terms of data, and they could act as the indexer. They build the project, they also index it, uh, and they receive rewards that way. There's no specific role for architects, but they play an important part anyway. Now let's just carefully consider the three main focus areas we have when we're designing the token economic model of the subquery network. There are three, and the first one is we're multi-chain by design. What that means is that the subquery network is designed from day one to support uh, indexing projects from any layer one network. Obviously our home is Polkadot, but in the future uh, we're aiming to expand other layer ones and that means that you can use the same subquery network to index uh, and transact for data from any other layer one that subquery supports natively. That is the way we're designing and building it. There won't be multiple subquery networks for each layer one, there will be a single one. The guiding principle of the subquery network is to make it as simple as possible. It's our view that other networks, other data providers, make overly complicated token economic models. And there may be a reason for this, but we think it makes it harder for people to access and be a part of. It means it's hard to predict uh, the rewards that you may receive from participating in it, for example. 
You want to make it more simple and easy to understand. Secondly, being accessible means that anyone can pick a partner, whether you're a delegator wanting to put your spare subquery tokens to work, or you want to be an indexer. We don't expect to have any uh, high minimum staking requirements to take part. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to access and lower the barriers to entry for anyone to take part. Really this culminates in our approach to design. We're spending a lot of effort right now in building the user interfaces that people will use to interact with the network, whether they're registering themselves in an indexer or delegating their tokens to another indexer. These user interfaces must be simple and easy to use and that's a big challenge and a big area of focus for our team right now. The third and final uh, design component of the subquery network is its flexibility. I've talked about this a lot. It's about being flexible in the way that you index that data. It's the flexibility of being able to index exactly the data that you want and you need for your app. But in this case, we're going to go a little bit further and this is a major difference of this version of the white paper to previous versions. It's a flexibility in the way that you pay. Let's take a step back and look at the ways that we currently pay for things in Web2. Whether it's the music you listen to, the movies and TV shows you watch in the evening, the applications that you use on a daily basis, the vast majority of things that we pay for and transact with are subscription based. We pay $19 a month to access the music that we love. We pay $20 a month for access to movies that we enjoy. And we pay $70 a year to access some of the coolest applications out there. Everything we're to right now generally revolves around subscription models. And there's a reason for that. Service providers uh, enjoy them because they provide predictable recurring revenue. Consumers, as well, enjoy them because it's a predictable outflow of my account every month. But this hasn't extended to Web3. In Web3, we still do transaction pricing and transaction fee payments. If it's the layer one network that you interact with has transaction fees, it's a decentralized exchange of choice that has transaction fees, and it's even other data providers that have transaction fees. Now in subquery, we're building in not one, but three different payment models. The first of the three is pay as you go. Again, this is that transaction fee style payment. Nothing new here. A certain indexer will advertise their prices to the subquery network, and consumers can make requests to that indexer at that certain price point. Potentially one subquery token per request. A closed agreement is an agreement between two parties, an indexer and a consumer. Those two parties will agree on certain parameters of the agreement. The number of requests that a consumer can make in a certain error, which is the length of time, and the total amount per error that that plan costs. It might mean something like they can make 100 requests for data in a certain day, or in each day, for 10 subquery tokens per day. Close agreements are perfect when a consumer wants to attract an indexer to index a brand new subquery project. They're putting their hands up in the air on the network and saying, please index this subquery project. I will guarantee rewards for you if you just index and give me that data. The third payment model is something is taking this to the next level. It's, the third payment model is taking this to the next level. We're calling it an open agreement. And an open agreement starts very similar to a closed agreement, an agreement between one indexer and one consumer, where they will agree to give let's say, 100 requests for 10 subquery tokens per day. The thing about an open agreement, though, is that other parties may join in on that agreement. And this creates a network where you might have multiple indexes providing data to multiple consumers at that pre-agreed price point. What this means is that you get... What this means is that you get this network effect where more indexes providing data results in better performance for the network and for the consumers that are participating in that agreement. The difference between closed agreements and open agreements is obviously a closed can only have two participants while an open can have as many as you want. 
So the combination of these three new payment models really changes things with the sub-query network. It makes it a lot more flexible for consumers to participate and pay for uh, the data that they receive in the ways they want, in the ways that make sense for them. It also can give indexes a lot more certainty of income, which is really important when running an expensive indexing process. Now I really encourage you all to read the rest of the white paper, including this token flow diagram uh, that I won't go into explaining here. But if you want to talk about it and you have any questions, please join our Discord. We are deep at work building the future of Web3 infrastructure. It's a lot of effort for us and we put a lot of effort into designing an economic model that makes sense, that's robust, reliable and scalable. Thank you very much for being a part of our efforts to revolutionise how we do Web3 infrastructure.